Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Home Study Course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. It's my pleasure to welcome Eric St. Cyr to the show. He is the CEO of Clover Asset Management Limited, and he is coming to us today from the very famed Cayman Islands. Eric, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me today. Well, good. The pleasure is all mine. We've had Josh on the show before uh, from your company, and we want to talk today about three major topics that will impact investment pretty dramatically over the next decade, and that is population growth, debt, and inflation. Let's dive right in and get your thoughts on these. Well, uh, we we do believe those will be the key drivers over the next 10 years, and uh, any investor that uh, is looking forward needs to take them into consideration. Uh, world population is, I would say, the most positive of them. Uh, it's pretty easy to look at it. Uh, for anybody that died today, you have two people which are born. So therefore, the world population is growing exponentially, and uh, there's, uh, there's more and more people out there to consume goods. But if we dig into the world population, we also see some uh, different characteristics than what we've been used over the last uh, few years. First of all, the world population is aging, and it's aging rapidly. In developed countries, you will soon have 30% of the world population, which would be over 65 years old. Therefore, uh, you will have uh, a change in in consumption patterns. I have a good example, which I think is a bit funny. In Japan this year is the first year that uh, they'll sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. Boy, that's a switch, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) You can imagine uh, the grocery uh, stores do not pack up the same stuff as they used to do. And if we we keep looking at the world population, uh, apart from aging, uh, you also have a a major shift into into, um, the middle class. So the world population is aging, but you also have the growth of the middle class. We expect the middle class to double in the next 25 years. That means that uh, in the 70s and the 80s, the population was also growing quite rapidly. However, most of the population was growing in extremely uh, poverty, in extreme poverty, so the impact on the global economy was quite limited. Today, with the emergence of China and soon to be followed with Indonesia, Malaysia, and India, uh, or the BRIC country, which is Brazil, Russia, and, and India, you will see much more demand for goods. So the world is aging. It's aging in developed countries, but it's also aging in the emerging countries as well. We expect to have 1.2 billion people over uh, 65 years old in, in the next few years. Yeah, that's, that's a, big, a big shift. Dive into that middle class increase in population a little bit. You said it would double over what period? Over the next, uh, well, we expect it to be uh, doubling by 2025. So now it's, so from, from 2000 to, to uh, 2025, it's, it's more than doubling. But we, the trend is continuing. So I would say every 25 years, so from 25 to 50, it would double again. Yeah. In, in the next basically 12 years then, it will double. And what are the numbers now? Of course, it, it's a little bit of a fuzzy target because it depends what we consider middle class. How many are in that middle class number now? And how many by 2025 in the next 12 years? What's the number on that? Well, we have about uh, 2.8, 2.9 in the middle class. And you're right to say that it's a a moving target. You're saying 2.8, 2.9 billion people. Billion, that's correct. And uh, we expect to be uh, past, I would say, 5.3, 5.4 by 2025. 
Wow, that that's a that's a big number. And what will the overall population of the Earth be by then? I would I would figure probably I haven't looked at those projections lately, but probably eight and a half billion by then, nine billion. Uh, uh, or more. By twenty twenty five, would be more than that. Would be over nine. Over nine billion. Wow, and we're at seven billion now. Amazing. That is really an amazing issue. It begs the question, Eric, that of a of a looming asset shortage. I remember reading a, a Michael Milken Milken Institute report on this years ago, along with Jeremy Siegel, and they talked about the looming asset shortage, that there just won't be enough assets for all these new entrants into the middle class to to buy. Kind of an a, a counterintuitive to the doom and gloom that we're, we're seeing out there nowadays. But your thoughts on that? Uh, the big pressure is going to be coming, we believe, on the, on the food uh, shortage. Uh, we don't believe there'll be enough ground if you want to grow all the, of the food that is necessary to, to feed such a, a growing population. Many reasons. First of all, oil is a limited resource and oil price is the number one driver of food price. So if you have a, a limited supply, increased demand in food, at the same time, uh, the price of oil is going up, and uh, you have a change in the, in the weather pattern. As the middle class is developing, their calorie intake is going to increase drastically. I, mean, I used to live in Trinidad and Tobago. 20 years ago, Trinidad and Tobago was mainly uh, eating rice and beans. In, uh, in today's world, uh, Trinidad and Tobago is the number one consumption of Kentucky Fried Chicken per capita. So a huge shift within 20 years of, uh, of what the people are eating. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure people caught that with your accent, and you were moving away from the <laughs> microphone a little bit. So what you're saying is that in Trinidad and Tobago, it was uh, largely a non-protein consumer, and then now it's the number one consumer of Kentucky Fried Chicken? Per capita in the world, yes. Per capita. Wow, that's amazing. That is an amazing, if not somewhat scary for health concerns, <laughs> fact, yeah. Wow. Well, it just show you the impact it's having on the uh, on the calorie intake. Therefore, demand for food is going to continue to grow, and we don't think that supply will will uh, will catch up with demand. So you should see huge inflation in food price going forward. And and food price inflation means overall inflation probably. Uh, yes, yes, uh, we see inflation also in commodity. Uh, if you're looking at uh, the year 2000, uh, China was consuming 14% of iron ore produced in the world. By 2010 they're consuming 61%. Why? Because they need to build all those infrastructure to service the population. They will not be consuming the same amount as we go forward as the infrastructure will be in place. But then you got country like uh, India will have a larger population than China by 2025. So you know there's other countries with high population that will take the slack. So uh, this bull market and commodity that started in the mid 2000s will probably continue for the next 20 years. Okay, good. Population growth, a huge issue, inflation. Uh, what are your projections and opinions on future inflation? Inflation will remain subdued for the next, uh, I would expect, for the next uh, 18 to 24 months. Uh, there's an uh, interesting experience happening in Japan right now where uh, they're printing, well, they're printing two and a half times more money now in percentage of the population than what the U.S. has been doing uh, recently. So, and what they really want to do is to move from a deflationary environment that they've been experiencing for the last 25, 30 years into inflation that's going to be uh, in excess of 2%. We don't think they'll be successful short term, but if you keep at it and all the central banks keep pushing money through the system, then you're going to have inflation. The problem with inflation is when it starts, it's extremely difficult to stop. And the only tool you do have to reduce inflation is to increase interest rates. Increasing interest rates with the environment that we're in right now would be uh, dreadful for, for the economy. So central bank in the world are going to face an extremely difficult time ahead of us. So we think in two years from now, we're going to see inflation 3 4 5%. Those are the, the, the declare number, the CPI number. The reality is everybody knows inflation has already been there for the last few years. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I say that inflation now in the U.S., United States inflation is about 9 to 10% already, and it's been that way for about a year and a half or so. You may well disagree with me. Of course, the government statistics massively malign it. But when you look at just food inflation here, health care inflation, and college tuition inflation, just those alone are, are phenomenal. And then you look at the past year and a half in real estate, 
it's obscured, of course, by uh, the artificially low interest rates we have. But house price inflation has been pretty dramatic, actually, over the last year and a half in many markets. So, of course, all real estate is local. So when you put the markets like Michigan in there and Ohio and these economies that may never come back, of course, that drags it down. But the places where there's growth and people want to actually live, there's inflation is pretty significant. Of course, it's mass because people buy houses on a payment rather than a, an overall price. They hide inflation in that way with artificially low rates. I agree with you. The, uh, the, the one we need to keep an eye on is, uh, is job creation. Until we have wage pressure, uh, we will have inflation, but it's going to be uh, limited to some sectors, mainly to uh, energy and uh, the food complex, which do not account, as a matter of fact, in the CPI. For most. So uh, the real estate is picking up, but from such a low base from where it was. What you need to look at is job creation. We think the real inflation is going to come when when you have job creation, which uh, you're starting to have right now. I mean, I know the numbers last Friday were not as good as everybody was expecting, but the reality is we've lost so much job in the Great Recession that uh, we, we're still uh, far behind where we were in uh, 2007. As we're moving toward those, uh, towards those points, uh, we think that inflation is going to come back, and that's when the money is going to start, uh, the velocity of money is going to start increasing quite a lot. Absolutely. Well, so what what uh, what is your strategy for handling these three major factors? Well, as the uh, as inflation increase and the population is is growing, population is positive for for most assets. So uh, as long as you you own the solid assets, the uh, inflation will take away. Uh, and the third one, which we haven't talked much about, is the, the world sovereign debt has ex- exceeded uh, 50 trillion. And everybody now is uh, finding the easy way to repay the debt is just to print money. So how do you face this and try to take advantage of it? We, we think you need to be in, in, uh, in solid investment. We like the, uh, we were talking about food, we like the, uh, the farming industry. We think the farming industries present uh, great potential. Inflation will affect negatively restaurants, grocery stores, but the, the food coming out of the farm uh, will uh, will will be able to pass inflation uh, down to the consumer. We like uh, sectors such as uh, like beer. Uh, the beer industry or the alcohol industry, if you want, is is growing. There's a, there's a World Health Organization uh, survey that was done uh, over the last few years. It's really interesting. Across the world, they asked the question: Over the last five years, did you increase or decrease your consumption of alcohol beverage? And uh, for anybody that decreased it, 15 people increased it, one five. So consumption of, of beer, wine, and spirit is, is increasing globally. And uh, we think that in good time or bad time, this is going to continue. So we like this sector. We think that uh, a lot of people are, uh, are seeing uh, safety in fixed income instruments. They buy bonds, they buy treasuries, they buy emerging market bonds especially in mutual funds on the retail side, and they're taking a huge risk with, uh, with their capital, and that's probably where the next bubble is going to blow. Financial advisors in, in the U.S. in particular have been pushing uh, mutual funds of, made of bonds the last few years, and when interest rates are going to start increasing, the safety net that the investor thought his, his, his bond mutual fund was is going to turn around, and, and, and they're going to realize they're losing 5 10 up to 25%. Everybody's going to rush for the door, and that, that may be having a disastrous impact on the portfolio. We like gold. Uh, gold is an interesting asset, but if you would ask me if I would prefer having $1,000 of gold as an asset or $1,000 of oil, I'll pick $1,000 of oil anytime. Oh, I, I, I've got to say, I totally agree. We did a report on this that's pretty interesting, actually, where we took and we looked at all of the gold supply on the entire planet, all of the gold ever mined from the earth, and that entire supply, and I can't remember the exact results of the study. It's about two years old, but this is something we, we researched and published ourselves. And then we took the value of the entire S&P, we took the value of all farmland, all agricultural land in the United States, And you could either have all the gold ever mined, or you could have, I believe, and don't quote me on this because I'd have to look at the report to remember, the entire S&P plus all farmland in the United States. 
which would you rather have? I'd of course rather have the, and oh, and then we took the entire GDP of the US, I believe. That was another comparison we did. And you know, which would you rather have? I'd rather have the GDP just for a year. I mean, it's, it's massively more valuable, which kind of proves, you know, it's a way of proving that gold is in a bubble. And since we published that report, gold has done, you know, nothing except to decline a bit. So maybe we were right. We buy gold, but we buy it in when when an individual uh, buy gold in, in the U.S. What they do is they they buy an asset which is gold and they sell the U.S. dollars against it. So what they are really doing is they're going long gold, short U.S. dollars. We think in the four major currencies out there, which are the U.S. dollars, the euro, the pound, and the yen, by far the best one is the U.S. dollars. So therefore, that trade, which is buying gold by selling U.S. dollars, is not a good trade. We would buy, we would recommend, and that's what we do with for our accounts, but for us to buy gold in yen term. So you are buying gold and you're shorting the yen, which is the Japanese currency at the same time. Yeah, I think shorting the yen is a pretty pretty good bet, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> yeah, and and shorting the U.S. dollars, and everybody in the U.S. hate the U.S. dollars. I think it's a misconception. The debt to GDP of the U.S. is not as bad as, as Europe would be or as Japan would be. So therefore, even if the situation is bad and you're growing the debt extremely rapidly, when you're comparing yourself to others, and, and currency is always a game of, of comparison. You always have to look what your currency is doing over other currencies. It's not an absolute trade. So therefore, uh, I think the U.S. dollar is, is well positioned and playing gold against the U.S. may not be the best trade right now. Yeah, well, that that is the good question. Compared to what everybody likes to talk about the demise of the U.S., but the question is compared to what? And the U.S. has a pretty darn unique position. It, it really does that no other country on earth enjoys. And I pick at it all the time. And I do believe America is in decline, but I think it's going to be a long, long, slow road down. Nothing as dramatic as many of the uh, doom and gloomers would would say. Your thoughts on that? All right. Well, I agree with you. If I'm comparing it to, to Europe or to Japan, I do believe some countries are, are better positioned than the U.S. forward. Uh, maybe I'm biased, but being Canadian myself, I think Canada, with a population of, what, 32, 35 million, may have more uh, natural resource than anybody else in the world, has a stronger financial system than, than the U.S., usually doesn't go to the same excess as the U.S. Uh, that, that's a beautiful currency to own long term. And I agree with you about Canada. Canada is a much better managed country. <laughs> There's no question about it. But the thing the U.S. has got, and this is where the math goes out the window. You know, everybody likes to talk about $16 trillion in debt, 60 to $120 trillion in unfunded entitlements over the next 20 years or so. And I agree. You know, mathematically, it's a disaster. Uh, and still not as bad a disaster as Europe. Well, many countries in Europe, not as bad a disaster as that. But here's the thing that's different. Of course, we all know the U.S. has the reserve currency that can be disputed and and people try to change it and so forth. But I don't know that it's going to change anytime soon. Far and away, the largest economy, the most powerful military to bully its way around and keep the reserve currency status, massive natural resources, excellent geography. I mean, in terms of potential threats uh, for war, the geography is great. Canada's is too, of course. It's got the international language, 230 plus year brand, if you will. I'm using brand in quotes because there isn't, you know, every country has a brand. There's a, a Canadian brand, an American brand. And so the American brand, it's been, although I believe it's in decline, synonymous with, it's been tarnished, no question about it. And I think it's declining in value. But overall, You probably have to agree with me, Eric, and I'm not being some provincial American here. I I take issue with everything America does lately. (laughs) But that brand that's 230 plus years old is synonymous with freedom, innovation, stability, and opportunity for most people around the world. And and yes, I think it's going the wrong direction, but it's going to take a heck of a long time to dislodge those pretty valuable assets. First of all, nobody's going to try to take your place as a reserve currency. If the euro would become the reserve currency tomorrow morning, it would go up in value by 20-30%. That would kill their economy. That would kill our export. So this this notion that the U.S. will, will lose its status as, as the global currency is not going to happen. That, that's interesting, but with, with China, and, and you know, I'll take the side of the anti-American side now, but with, with China and Japan holding so much 
debt that is just getting debased through inflation. Gosh, I, I hear about Russia and China and Brazil trading outside of the dollar and setting up these these deals to go around the reserve currency. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't think they're going to do it. I don't think it's ever really going to happen because... If China wouldn't like the U.S. dollar, they wouldn't peg the currency to it and cheat by having really cheap export. Right, yeah, right. Like yeah, they, they artificially suppress the value of their currency to increase exports. So that, that's all a political game. As it comes to the uh, the debt of their own, it is just a start. Japan and the Japanese pension fund, because of the, the, the problem that they will be facing, the interest rates on 10 years in Japan were below 0.6% last week. They pay nothing. As inflation is going to come back, the real rate of return is going to be negative. So therefore, you're going to start to be to see a de-investment of Japanese pension fund and in moving into other currencies and other fixed income. And where else do you think they're going to go? Yeah. So if you think Japan owns a lot of U.S. debt right now, it's just the start of it. Because for them, it'd be much more secure. And the way they're seeing it is, well, our interest rates are now at 0.6%. We were where the U.S. is right now 10, 20 years ago. So we can buy that debt at 1.82% and write it down to 0.6% again in a stronger currency than ours. So they're just starting to buy your debt. There's plenty of buyer out there. You're not going to have a debt crisis as soon as you don't create it yourself. Yeah, it's it's so interesting that you say that because you listen to some of the doomsayers and they say, oh no, you know, the treasury auctions are looking weak and you know, <laughs> you've just got so many problems on the horizon. I don't know. That would be If that would be true, interest rates would be at 3 or 4%, right? Well, yeah, but there are artificial ways to manipulate them, right? Yes, but it, that game is played everywhere in the world. So it's there. We we need to realize that the Fed is not going to move out. It's going to continue to buy to buy bonds. They may reduce their buying, but I think there's we're still in, we're still having the Fed buying uh, securities and fixed income securities for the next two or three years. The problem is like a drug. How do you pull out of it, right? Uh, yeah, right, right, exactly. It's it's a very addictive situation and a, a self-perpetuating machine. The, so the interesting thing about alcohol stocks, that's sort of a sad commentary in a way, <laughs> just talking about how thing, things get worse and people just hide their, drown, drown their sorrows in, in booze, huh? Uh, well, in a certain way, it's sad. And on the other end, you, you may look at it from... Uh from the perspective that the middle class in, in emerging markets has much more discretionary spending. Look at a country like Brazil, which was a slum 20 years ago, which, which now has a really solid middle class. They will have the Olympics and the World Cups in the next three years. There's no way that the population down there is not going to drink more beer going forward than what they've done in the last few years. So therefore, uh, ABV, which is a ticker for the largest beer company down there, is an interesting stock to own. Uh, we like something we didn't talk about, but as the population is aging, we have a massive investment in funeral homes. That's a sad story. That's a boring business, but give me a business in the U.S. that's going to grow by 15 20% a year for the next uh, 15, 20 years. Yeah, pretty reliable. <laughs> it really yeah. is, unless there's some big new discovery there. Very interesting stuff. Well, give out your website at Clover, if you would, and tell people where they can learn more about you. Yes, uh, we are at uh, clover.ky, clover.ky, and uh, you can reach us uh, through emails. You can reach me directly at eric at clover.ky, E-R-I-C, or you may call us at 345-926-0005, 345-926-0005. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate having you on the show. Great. Thanks for your time. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.